Hello everyone and welcome to Arcane Arts. I'm your host, Reverend Shedite. This weekly show is meant to help teach new Wicca and Wicca Wicca and Witchcraft students. I've been a practicing magician for over twenty two years. And what I want to do is share what I've learned along the way. <coughs> Pardon me. Today I want to discuss the Wiccan Read, which is a cornerstone of Wiccan ethics. Um, and it's something that anybody who's just pra starting to practice w Wicca or witchcraft in the Wiccan style needs to be familiar with. We're also going to discuss the rules of magic, um, a list of not necessarily hard and fast rules written by Oberon Zale Ravenheart in his book Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard. Um, and the advice that the rules of magic gives is something I believe is very valuable for any um, anyone who's just starting to practice witchcraft. We're also going to talk about the Corellian virtues, nine traits that the Corellian tradition, which is where I come from, and believes um, helps guide a person to being their best self. But let us start with the Wiccan Reed. Eight words the Reed fulfill, and ye harm none, do what ye will. The Wiccan Reed is a central ethical guideline within the Wiccan tradition. It provides a framework for moral conduct and decision making. Rooted in the principles of harm none and the acceptance of personal responsibility, the reed serves as a compass for Wiccans navigating our spiritual path. For those of us new to Wicca, understanding the reed is pivotal to embracing the ethical foundation of the religion. At its core, the Wiccan reed encapsulates a simple yet profound principle. And it harm none, do what ye will. The statement encourages Wiccans to act in ways that do not cause harm to themselves to others, or to the environment. It promotes a harmonious existence where individuals are mindful of the consequences of their actions. This principle is akin to the concept of karma, emphasizing the interconnectedness of all things, and the idea that one's deeds will ultimately return to them. The phrase, do what ye will, is often misconstrued as an open license for unrestrained behavior. However, a deeper examination reveals the reed advocates responsibility and considerate actions. It encourages individuals to exercise their free will, but within the boundaries of ethical conduct. This implies that while Wiccans have the freedom to pursue their desires, we must do so without causing harm or infringing upon the well-being of others. The reed not only addresses outward actions, but also highlights the importance of internal ethical reflection. As Wiccans, we are encouraged to examine our intentions and motivations before undertaking any action. This introspective aspect of the read promotes a deeper understanding of oneself and fosters personal growth. By lining our true will with the principle of harm none, Wiccans strive to cultivate a sense of moral integrity that extends beyond mere external behavior. Interpreting the reed requires an appreciation for the interconnectedness of nature and the belief in the sacredness of all life. As Wiccans, we view the world as a web of, of energies where every action, no matter how small, ripples through the interconnected threads. This perspective underscores the significance of mindful living and the need to consider the broader implications of one's choices. The Wiccan Read also places a strong emphasis on personal responsibility. As Wiccans, we are encouraged to take ownership of our actions and their impact on the world around us. This responsibility extends to both the mundane and magical aspects of life. <coughs> whether in everyday interactions or in the practice of spellcraft. 
Wiccans are encouraged to be aware of our of the potential consequences of our actions and to act in a way that aligns with the reed. For those new to Wicca, the Wiccan reed serves as a guiding light, helping them navigate the complexities of ethical decision making. It provides a moral framework that is adaptable to various situations empowering individuals to make choices that are in harmony with the principles of the religion. Embracing the reed is not a rigid adherence to a set of rules, but, a, but rather a dyna dynamic and evolving commitment to live in accordance with the principles of love, harmony, and responsibility. Now, something that the the read also goes along with, and I did forget to include it in my script, so I'm not going to talk about it a lot here. Um, is the so is the threefold law. The threefold law tells us that anything that we do, anything that we put out into the universe, whether good or bad, comes back to us three times. Um, some will say that it's a literal three times. Um, so if you do something good or bad of X value, you'll get three times X value back. Um, some say three is more should be treated more as a metaphor for multiple times, and therefore whatever you put out comes back multiple times until you've learned the lesson. Um, but it may or may not be exactly three times. Um, there are also a few who say that anything um, that three represents the, th the three different ways whatever you put out in the universe, good or bad, will come back to you. They say that anything you do will come back to you physically, mentally, and spiritually. Um, I will say that that last position seems to be, um, in my experience at least, much a bit of a minority. Uh, with the first one, Whatever uh, one says that it will come back in literally three times, um, seeming to be more prevalent in Wicca. Uh, we will talk about the threefold law in more depth in in a few upcoming episode. And I apologize if you're hearing background noise. I did not mean that for there to be background noise, but apparently. As soon as I started recording, my neighbors in this duplex I live in decided they needed to do work in the backyard. So, sorry about the, I assume that's a saw. Let us move on and discuss the rules of magic. The rules of magic are a list proposed by Oberon Sale Ravenheart in his book, The Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard. And I do think that they are worth including on a list like this because they I do believe that they are actually quite important. They are not necessarily hard and fast rules. Um, but for a new practitioner, these are very useful rules to follow. Um, and as you get further into your path, maybe you'll stop thinking about these rules as much because you'll just have integrated how they work and what they recommend into your practice at a more fundamental level. Um, but these are little things that are worth keeping in the back of your head. Rule one, magic is real. Um, if you're going to practice witchcraft, that is a fundamental rule you have to know. Magic, the practice of the witches, of uh, casting spells and raising energetic circles is all real. Um, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be doing this. Um, magic is real and it works. And this also applies to the spirit realm. If you summon a spirit or a demon or what have you from the spirit realm, remember, these are real beings. The second rule is to know yourself. 
Socrates once told his students that an unex unexamined life is not worth living. As you travel the path of an of a witch or wizard or magician, whatever you call yourself, um, you will maintain a magical journal, a book of shadows or grimoire, um, and it is very useful to go back and look at what you've done in the past, um, so that you may learn from your mistakes and from your successes. Um, but you must also know yourself, know who you are as a person. Uh, you, these are things that through meditation and shadow work, um, you'll discover about yourself. And in time, we will get there. Um, another part of knowing yourself is knowing where your personal and ethical boundaries lie. Um, and being true to yourself and to not cross those lines if it ever comes up. <clears throat> Number three, the best way to predict the future is to create it. It is our nature to want to know or control what is about to happen. Um, and over the millennia, people like rulers have turned to the practitioners of the magical arts um, and to divination to learn what lies ahead. As we are able to work with the energies that the gods have given us, um, we have the way to not only predict the future, but to shape it as, as it comes. Rule four, question authority. Why is a very powerful word. As a witch or wizard, especially one who's starting out, you should politely question why something is done and why it is done a certain way. Understanding why leads to understanding how. Your ability to question why something is being asked or um, will help protect you. Questioning can, can and must be done with respect for the teacher. However, you must always be willing to stand up and say no when something go, someone gives you an instruction that goes against what you know to be in your best interest. Your ability to question why will help protect you from others who wish to manipulate you. That is unfortunately an issue in our community is there are, and in any religious community for that matter, but there are so many people out there who wish to manipulate you for their own ends, usually for their own financial ends. And being able to question why and walk away with a satisfactory answer is certainly one of the keys to helping protect yourself. Number five. Magic is both an art and an experimental science. Some people like some artists, are naturally good at magic. However, with practice, someone who is not as good as others can easily become better than those who put no effort into the work but have a natural talent for it. Remember that authors, writers, and lecturers try to share magic the way they know how. But that does not mean that it will work perfectly for you. Experiment and use what others say as a guide, not as the law. I can tell you I have personally had this issue where, especially when I was new, if somebody told me, you have to do something this way, um, and it didn't work for me. And the solution, of course, was really, if you go back to the last one, the last rule where it said question authority, if it has to be done this way, why does it have to be done this way? Is a valuable question. But also, as this, rule, this fifth rule points out, magic is an art and a science, and an experimental science. So, while we learn how to craft, we must also uh, craft our spells, craft our magic. We should also be willing to experiment with it. If, it, if we're told, you know, do it this way, try it some other way. See what happens. The worst that will happen is it won't work. 
And it is, an, I, I have found in that experimenting, you find what works best for you. Um, if you look at the field of magic known as chaos magic, um, that is very much a key philosophy in what they do, is they experiment and they try monkeying with how things work um, in order to see what really does work. And they even encourage other people to effectively do peer review on their new magical styles or techniques. Um, so if you're a little bit interested in how magic is an experimental science, I would recommend looking into chaos magic. Uh, the next rule on the list, be watchful of what you say and do. Magic happens all the time, not just when you're in a ritual. Even when you don't mean to, what you say and what you do can influence the world around you. It can impact the same energies that we use when, at, when ritually conducting a spell or ritual. So even when you're not in the magical space, be watchful what you say and do because it can have the same effect as if you had intentionally cast it as a spell. And as you develop your magical abilities even more, this rule will actually become even more important. Rule number seven. Intention controls results. <clears throat> our most powerful tool is our intention. It is our will to manifest what we desire. It is from our intention, that deep part of our our soul, our psyche, that magic works from. When you conduct a spell or a ritual, the accoutrements that you use, the ceremony robes you wear, the candles you burn, and the incense you burn, um, all of it, it helps get you in the correct mind space to conduct a ritual but the actual magic the actual force um, that helps shape your spell is your intention and it comes from a very deep spot within your your soul your spirit um, so it is your intention that always will control results Um, but with intention must also come action. If you have a test coming up and your intention is to ace the test, magic can help. Your intention can help. But if you don't put the work in to study, it won't matter. Um, what we what really meant is important to take away for this rule is that your intention controls results and you must be very clear with your intention before you start your working. Rule number eight, don't invoke what you can't banish. As we've mentioned, magic is real. Things that you bring forth from the spirit realm are real. Um, when you bring it when you're in the ritual space and you summon the elements or the watchtowers or the guardians or deities or ancestor spirits, they do exist and they will be present if you call them. As a beginning practitioner, you're going to probably be working with some of the more friendlier members of the spirit realm. Um, but as you go deeper, you're going to encounter some that may not be as friendly and know that they all have their own agenda and that agenda may not be the same as yours when we say don't invoke what you can't banish what we are saying is do not bring something into your ritual space that you do not have the ability to push out of your ritual space to well banish from it um, and when we get to that point, we will cover banishing spells. 
and rituals to help you push those unwanted and energies or beings out. Number nine. Rule number nine. Always consider the options. There is always options, various ways to act or not to act. Since magic operates within the greater laws of the universe, it remains true that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Your analysis of the options may, to any given situation, must include an understanding of the consequences, or at least to the best of your ability. Sometimes a third or fourth option is better than the either or option selection most people think are their only choices. In other words, think before you act. Rule number 10. The job isn't over until you put away the tools and cleaned up the mess. And this is actually true with a lot, a lot of things, not just magic. But, but as far as this is concerned, your task, your ritual is not done until you have put your space back to its neutral state and returned everything to its place. A magical circle left in disarray will drain the focus and the energy from your working and undo what you have worked to create. And finally, rule number 11. Keep silent regarding a magical work for 24 hours, lest your analysis create doubt, thereby weakening the intention that binds your spell. As the rules I mentioned before, magic is real and intention controls results. Once you have cast your spell or your ritual, you, and you've raised the energy and you have focused your intention to conform with your will, and you've put it out there, it, is, it begins. Sitting there after the fact analyzing your spell and your ritual, um, picking apart any little mistakes that you made, and we all do make mistakes in our rituals and spellcraft, most of the time it doesn't matter. Um, but as you sit there picking it apart, you can also create doubt in your own mind. And that doubt will change your intention, or at least weaken your intention, and therefore weakening your spell. The best way, and it's what I found, is after it's done, if I need to document anything in my Book of Shadows, I do, and then I just let it go. And the next day, or at least 24 hours later, then I come back and take a look at what I did, what went right for this, my ritual, what went wrong for the ritual, um, and do I already start seeing my, my magical working starting to work. Those are the rules of magic. As, as I said, they were written by Oberon Zell Ravenheart in his Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard. Um, as a new practitioner to the magical arts, these may be, it may be worth it to keep these at the front of your brain. But as you do continue along your path, um, you'll find that these will just become part of how you do stuff how you do your magic, and you don't necessarily think of them consciously. Um, yeah. And the next section I would like to address are the Corellian virtues. The Corellian virtues are nine virtues that in the Corellian tradition of Wicca we can believe are the ideals for a person to be. Is it likely or that you're going to meet all the virtues? No. I certainly don't, um, but they are things you should strive for. The virtues are honesty, practicality, courage, sincerity, grunt, generosity, compassion, modesty, service, and piety. Let us briefly discuss each one of them. Honesty. 
being straightforward in what you do, telling the truth and abiding by your word. Honesty is associated with the candle. Number two, practicality. Consider the long-term effects of your actions and make choices accordingly. Practicality is associated with the altar tool of the wand. Number three, courage. The ability to meet and overcome challenges. It is associated with the altar tool of the blade. Number four, sincerity. Being true to yourself in what you believe, walking the walk, and talking the talk. It is associated with water. Be it the elemental representation of water, or the altar tool of water that you would have in a small bowl on your altar. Number five, generosity. Openness of spirit allowing movement and growth around you, and also within you. It is associated with the altar tool of the chalice. Compassion. Sympathy for and help with the well-being of others. It is associated with the altar tool of cakes. Number seven, modesty. Recognizing the value of others and their skills and accomplishments and not feeling threatened by them it is associated with the altar tool of salt. Number eight, service. The desire to help others and to create a better world it is associated with the flame. And if I may say, the reason, part of the reason that I make these videos and publish my online book of shadows for anyone to read, part of that is service. It is my desire to help others and to create a better world for our community. And the last of the Corellian virtues is piety. The bonds on which society is built, respectful and reciprocal relationship with the deity, with family, be it a family of blood or of choice, and with society as a whole. It is, it is associated with the altar tool of incense. Now that you have an introduction to the Wiccan Reed, and the rules of magic, and the Corellian virtues, I hope you um, think about how you can implement this all in your life to make you a better person and a better magician. Um, as these are as these videos are meant to be a series of lessons, I'm going to give you your first homework assignment. I'm not sure if I've already done this one in the last video, but if not, I'm doing it here. Um, and that is to acquire a notebook. A way for you to no take notes and to record your practice. It will become the beginning of your Book of Shadows, your grimoire, your... I don't want to quite say Bible, but for some of us, that is exactly what our Book of Shadows is. And I want you to take what you've learned in this lesson and the last one, and start writing down what is Wicca, what is witchcraft. Write down the Wiccan read, or especially that key phrase, and it harm none, do what you will, um, and write down what that means to you. Write down the rules of magic, and write down the virtues and start thinking about how these things can apply to you and apply to shape how you, what you want to get out of your magical and religious practice. Until next week's episode, I wish you all the best and I wish you all good health. Please check out my website at wiccan.pw and follow my YouTube channel, The Temple of the Starry Sky. Thank you, take care, and may you bless it be.